All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Bug Fest. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in to our programs. Glad that you can join us. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris Smith. I am curator for the SECU Daily Planet Theater here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And yeah, this week, starting yesterday all the way through Saturday, is Bug Fest. We have programs happening several times a day, every day for the next five days. Uh, all kinds of incredible topics. You can learn about amazing arthropods, join us for crafts. We did bug yoga this morning. So we're having a great celebration of all things bugs. Check out bugfest.org to get more information about upcoming programs, to register and sign up to get uh, the links and access information for more of these programs, just like this one. Uh, and we hope that we'll see you, see you around. Uh, some cool stuff that's happening. The museum is gonna be reopening soon. Actually a week from today, I'm actually here in the museum to try to get ready and do a little bit of training and get stuff ready. So that's very exciting. Naturalsciences.org is gonna be your access for information on how to come back and visit us starting as soon as next week. But right now, I want to introduce someone very special who's going to be talking to us about our theme insect this year for Bugfest, Dr. Brian Wiegman. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. Um, happy to be a part of Bugfest. Now, you're a fly expert. Is this correct? That's true. Yeah, I study um, all things about flies, especially their evolution and genetics. Okay, interesting. So we're probably gonna get a little bit of a perspective on flies today that most folks wouldn't have mm -hmm. when you're just sort of swatting them away from your picnic lunches, right? That's true, yeah. Most people just think of a house fly when they think of flies or maybe a fruit fly, but there's a lot more there uh, in what this uh, enormous insect order. Lot to know. Mm -hmm. So everybody, Dr. Brian here is a professor of entomology in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at North Carolina State University. So please give him a warm welcome in the chat. And don't forget, as we go, you can leave your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat box, and we'll pose those questions to Brian at the end of the presentation. Brian, take it away. Thanks. Hmm. How do I share my screen? <laughs> we'll fix it. Don't worry. We just need to make, I need to click the button. We need to click the button. Uh, let's see, that would be, now try it. Got it. Excellent. Fantastic. So today I'm uh, gonna tell you a lot more than you ever thought you knew, would, would know about flies. Uh, like I said a few minutes ago, uh, flies are one of the large insect orders, uh, and there's a lot of kinds of flies out there in the natural world. I call them on this slide, and in my title of my talk, I call them nature's uh, biological super doers because they do so many things. They have super diversity. There are many, many functions that flies play in the environment. And what you don't realize is that flies are all around us. They're incredibly numerous. And they're very, very fascinating once you get to know a little bit about it. So biologists like me studying flies, there are many, many things that I can learn and study about what flies do in nature. And if you're the kind of person that really pays attention to what's going on in the natural world, the closer you look, the more interesting things you can find out about everything that's going on around you. Now, this mountain stream is a typical mountain stream like you would find in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And when you walk up to the stream, uh, your first view is of its beauty, of the lush green vegetation, the sound of the ripples. Um, but what you realize as you walk up to it is there are things flying all around in the air here. 
And most of those things, many of those things are flies. And this habitat is full of places for flies to live, for flies to find things to eat. And uh, all of a sudden you realize that there's a lot of nature uh, going on in this environment. Flies are helping to sustain uh, this environment. Oh, got it. Oh, so what I said was that flies are really numerous. They're super abundant. Flies and a few other insect orders have really started to use, have, have learned to use flight as a major part of their life. They've colonized the air, if you will, and they use it to find mates and to fly around and find food. And, uh, and their numbers, their sheer numbers rival those of like krill in the oceans. So flies in the Arctic, flies in Siberia, uh, flies in tropical rainforests get up to incredible numbers and uh, they are all there because they have found a habitat where they can succeed and they're one of the most successful groups of organisms on the planet. So studying flies, I get to be out in nature, find flies in the places that they're doing things. This is me out on Mount Mitchell. Uh, with my net over my head, looking at the little tiny flies that I've caught in that net. So this is an entomologist in action, and we get to go to places and really try to understand how flies fit into our natural environment. I'm going to tell you a lot about flies and the things that they do and what makes them so successful in places like this, in places like that mountain stream, and in places like deserts and jungles. So like I said, flies are one of the big insect orders and there are a lot of different kinds of flies, big ones and small ones, things like um, tiny midges and mosquitoes, tiny gnats, uh, and then bigger flies, house flies and bee flies and flower flies. There are many, many different kinds. What makes a fly unique and makes, really makes a fly an actual true fly is that flies have just two wings. Most insects that have wings have four wings, a pair of front wings and a pair of hind wings, like this monarch butterfly or this damselfly. They have four wings. All flies have reduced their number of wings down to a number, down to two. So flies, you can recognize a fly by counting its wings. And for flying, it only needs two. Here's some fly facts. There are more than 170 families of flies. There are about 158,000 described species. So it's an incredibly large insect order. And by saying there are 170 families, there are 175 large groups of, of fly kinds uh, that are found all over the world. And we've categorized them into these 170 families. They live on all continents, including the edges of Antarctica. They eat almost anything. So flies as larva uh, have placed their eggs into their food usually, and those fly larvae or maggots uh, can do very, very well eating away inside whatever, wherever their eggs have been laid. Flies, like I said, have only two functional wings and flies are used to study genetics, solve crimes, clean wounds in hospitals, control insect pests. They decompose waste, so you know flies are attracted to all kinds of things that are decomposing in the environment. And so they are really important in, in circulating and, and returning nutrients back into the soil uh, as they uh, work to break down biological material. And because flies are such a big part of the natural world, they're often used by scientists, conservation biologists, ecologists, and uh, people who are monitoring the health of the environment. Is this environment healthy? Uh, is there a lot of uh, indicators of uh, how well things are going in this place? Because they're an important, flies are an important part of the natural uh, connections that are going on in, um, in all sorts of environments. So not only are flies out there and successful just living on the planet, we are also using them in many ways to understand what's happening in the planet, on the planet.
Now, as a scientist who study flies, what I do is study the, the DNA sequences of flies and try to understand their interrelationships. So there's a, 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 a great diversity of different kinds of flies and we can understand how they're related one to another by looking directly at their genetics by using modern molecular biology and comparative research. And once we do that, we end up with sort of a big family tree of all the flies. This is a sort of circular tree with the branches are the tips of that tree around the circle. And what you can see is that what we are try to learn are all of the interrelationships between the different kinds of flies, small and big flies and flies that do different things in different places. If you will, this is sort of a tree of life uh, for all of the fly kinds. This is another depiction of that fly tree of life. Uh, and what you can see is that there's an enormous amount of diversity, a very large diversity of kinds and types um, with, with different branches that have branched off from the main stem going all the way back to more ancient flies. If we look at a close up of that uh, tree of life for flies, you can see all of the different kinds and shapes and sizes of flies uh, that we know about as scientists from the typical flies that land on your picnic table to weird little flies. And so this gives us a, a really fascinating, interesting uh, sort of diversity of things to study about what flies do, how they look and what their role is in, natural, in the natural world. So just thinking about the tree of all life, flies are so diverse that they make up 15% of that tree. So if you counted up all of the kinds of different organisms, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of organisms, plants and animals, flies make up 15% of that tree. So we say that they have a super biodiversity over 158,000 described species, and we find new species every day in over 170 families. And why they're such super doers is they have many ecological roles. In the environment, they're doing very many things to find food. So for example, uh, flies go to flowers and take nectar. And so you find flies like this flower fly uh, landing on flowers and getting covered with pollen and they become very, very important pollinators in our garden or in, in the natural um, uh, forest or field environment. Um, mosquitoes are a kind of fly and mosquitoes take blood meals to get their protein and to, uh, and to have the protein they need to, to lay eggs. So uh, female mosquitoes are blood feeders and that makes them sort of important as pests. But uh, they are just a, a, another kind of fly with a different sort of habit uh, for how it finds food. These little tunnels in this leaf are a tiny fly that lays its eggs into the leaf surface and those eggs hatch and the larva feeds for its entire uh, uh, life, life cycle as a maggot until it comes out as an adult. Uh, those uh, flies live under the cuticle of the leaf and make a leaf mine. And so there are flies that eat plants and flies that eat other insects and flies that grow up in, in a cow pad. So there are many, many different things that flies do. Flies are also a very old insect order. The first flies go back to the Permian geological period, which is about 260 million years ago. The first flies sort of emerged on the scene and th that was before there were any dinosaurs. They outlived the dinosaurs all the way to today. Uh, and uh, you can see they're older than the flowering plants. This uh, uh, slide has a fossil horsefly here uh, from the Jurassic. So this, this fly, um, much like a modern horsefly, was around in ancient environments where dinosaurs lived and probably you know, may have been able to feed on them. And this, so this is a rock compression fossil of a, an early fly from the Jurassic. But what's certainly true is that flies are everywhere. They show up all around us and they're, we, we take them for granted. They're, they're a nuisance. Um, they're walking around and flying around on everything. Uh, and that makes them a really um, sort of big part of the natural world. 
So this science that I do is called systematics. It's um, a branch of science that's called this, that sort of is, is focused on um, discovering, organizing, and interpreting biological diversity. So questions about what something is, what it's related to, where it's from, the categorization of how many they are, and, and why are they so diverse is a really important part of science because it helps us to build a system for understanding all of the different things that we encounter in the world. And the question really is so, okay, so there's a lot of different kinds of things, who cares? Well, actually, nearly everyone should, and most people do, because in one way or another, they all come in contact with us in many, many ways uh, throughout our life, but also are part of sustaining um, this really diverse and intricate, complex natural environment. So for example, so for example, you know, flies are really important to farmers because flies are a big part of uh, their fields and their crops. So th these flies are, have all found a very nice uh, place to sit in the sun on the back of this cow, but there are flies that are all around in these environments, some of which um, are either beneficial or or not to uh, the livestock that they live around. And so farmers often have to know how to control the flies uh, that are in their, on their farms. Flies are an incredibly important part of our agricultural system because some flies feed on farmers' plants, but flies are also um, often parasites or predators of the insects that other insects that feed on these plants. So they make up these natural food webs that interact and have big implications for our crop yields, for our pollination, and for all of the different things that farmers do to keep their fields sort of healthy and productive. And climate change and the, the climate and what's going on in terms of how well these farms will do, all of these uh, sort of natural elements of biodiversity have a big a big role to play in uh, being able to sustain uh, the productivity uh, in the agricultural system. Flies are great flyers. <laughs> so like their name suggests, uh, flies are good at flying. And uh, they're, they're, we often sort of see them uh, sort of hovering at a flower, flying upside down, uh, landing almost everywhere, and being very, very hard to swat. Uh, with, so we, so one of the ways we uh, sort of uh, experience flies so often is that they're flying all around us. Well, that's really, really true that they're one of the best flyers in nature. They can fly in any direction, up, down, forward, and backward. The fastest recorded wing beat is six, over 62,000 beats per minute by a little midge. Um, they fly to find mates, to lay eggs. Uh, to disperse to different places, to find food, to escape danger, like somebody's gonna swat them, uh, and to explore new places to live in general. So it's, this ability to fly has basically allowed them to colonize uh, habitats all over the earth, find new things and um, adapt to new environments. So if you look at a comparison of the strength of flight muscle, the power that you get from flight muscle, in different uh, things or different kinds of muscle, um, just to compare uh, the ability of flies, uh, the efficiency that they get from, from being able to fly. Blowfly flight muscle there in the middle of the screen is uh, almost half as much as the power you get from a typical airplane engine. And uh, they are among the strongest flyers of, of these various uh, um, comparisons in terms of flight muscle power output. So if we zoom in and look at a really close image of a fly, what you can see is it's got all sorts of anatomical adaptations that make it extremely well adapted to whatever it needs to do to survive. Flies are covered with long bristle-like hairs that each are sensory uh, so that it can sense its environment. It has antennae on the front of its face uh, for, do, for uh, detecting chemicals in the environment. They have big multifaceted eyes. They're great flyers. They can, um, they can use all of these different adaptations basically uh, to sort of um, 
get around, do the things they need to do and take advantage of uh, all of the different uh, aspects of uh, their surroundings. We always recognize flies by being amazing at uh, sort of landing upside down on glass or walking in all sorts of um, uh, positions where we would think it would be hard to hold on. So flies can walk on glass and that's because they have these pads on their feet. So here's an electron micrograph um, um, photograph of, of uh, fly feet. And so rather than just pads on the bottom of its feet, actually those pads are made up of tiny little hooks that all, all of which have a little flat pad on the end of it. And those hooks basically increase the surface area of the pads of their feet. Uh, and so that the, their feet um, can, can uh, grab onto any microstructure, any little bit of surface structure uh, on a smooth surface and, uh, and grab on like Velcro basically. So they have all of these bristles and hairs for sensing um, and, and adjusting how they're, how they're standing on that surface. So there's very, very high complexity in, and uh, really interesting adaptations for allowing flies to be very good at both grabbing onto a surface and then also launching from that surface very quickly when it needs to take flight. And so as an entomologist, what I find myself doing is being outstanding in the field. <laughs> that, what I really mean is we go out into the field and uh, search for flies with, a, with an insect net, just like anybody can do. And the more we find, the more fascinating we are uh, and more fascinating the flies are. And uh, we, we get out to different places in all over the world, my colleagues and I, looking very hard at what's flying around on those flowers. And what, what do we catch when we sweep this net through these weeds? And often we find things that surprise us are new to science and um, lead to new discoveries about what flies can do. But being a fly scientist, of course, often, you know, sort of it's not as glamorous as maybe studying butterflies. Um, it's just not a glamorous thing because flies are really difficult, really tiny often. They're difficult to identify and hard to really know. Um, there are more biters and blood feeders and disease transmitters than in any other insect order. So because flies have learned to do all of these different things and colonize all these different habitats, and many of them are, um, are pests, uh, that they're not the most fun things to, to, to study. Um, they're fond of dung. So as we know, uh, flies are attracted to the rich uh, resource of excrement. Uh, they're also attracted to corpses and cadavers and rotting um, animals that have died, for example. Uh, and so breaking down all of this stuff, um, basically maggots, the fly larva is called a maggot, are, um, are found in almost all of these places. These aren't glamorous things, but they're pretty interesting for a biologist. So I've mentioned these maggots. All higher flies have the maggot as a larva. And that a maggot is basically a larva where its head capsule has been completely reduced. So now there's no head, there's just a set of hooks. Uh, it's mandible or a set of hooks. And that allows it to emerge from its egg right in its food. Often flies lay their eggs right on where those maggots are going to uh, find their food. And, these, and maggots can then live in their food, uh, any sort of wet, nutritious, sort of biological material is a potential food for maggots. And uh, so for example, this tree stump uh, with moss covering it, uh, with decaying sort of rotting uh, natural sort of wood inside there, so sort of slowly get, getting back to being sort of nutritious soil in the forest, this will be home for a lot of different kinds of flies. Many, many different kinds of fly groups will take advantage of this sort of moist, nutritious environment of a decaying tree stump. So it's not, not all, it, it's sort of a part of the process of breaking this down, ends up being a rich habitat for all sorts of different flies and flies that are predators of other insects or flies that eat fungus that are growing in these wet habitats or flies that are living in the mossy covering of this tree stump. So this is a typical fly habitat you can find right in the forest behind your home. 
Here's a close-up micrograph of a, a maggot. It's hard to even tell the front end from the back end of this maggot. The front end is up here, the tapered top. <clears throat> and it's completely reduced to a tube for eating. You can see again, a close up of this maggot with its mouth hooks, these scraping walrus like hooks, where it will simply sort of turn whatever it's feeding in into a more liquid form it can suck in. And these are not its eyes, but these are the antennae of this maggot. So once you get a really, really close look at, at what uh, flies look like as larvae, uh, you realize then how they've adapted to use that stage of their life to really, really grow and feed uh, in wherever they've been, wherever their eggs have been laid. The pros of being a fly scientist is that there are so many habits and habitats to investigate for flies that it becomes very interesting to learn all of the different biological stories associated with what flies do. And they occur on every continent. So there's lots of great places to go and lots of great things to think about that, that, that uh, flies are doing. This may, has made them really important model organisms for research. So because flies have very, very rapid or fruit flies have very, very rapid life cycle. Uh, it made them a perfect model organism for geneticists to study in the laboratory um, all aspects of fly genetics because you could breed so many generations so quickly uh, in the lab. And so they're really important to human health and economy, um, really because of all of the different things they do. They're, they're pollinators, they decompose things as I already said, and their food for birds, lizards, frogs, fish, they're a big part of what we would call a natural food web. What I'm gonna tell you for the rest of this talk probably is that what I also think is that flies are really beautiful. We don't really think of flies as beautiful and I'm showing you some pretty shocking photographs already of maggots and uh, flies close up, uh, but actually, like all uh, um, natural things, um, you can certainly see a lot of beauty um, throughout the diversity of flies. So like I said, just to, to sort of show you an image of what I mean about flies being an important part of food webs, we take for granted that there are a lot of flies out there and we don't like it when they're at our picnic, but what they're doing is sort of feeding, living, doing well in the environment. And really by doing, doing that in such great numbers, they provide food for a lot of other organisms. So like a dragonfly or a robin or a thrush or, um, might eat this fruit fly. And those, and those are part of the connected food webs that um, make up any natural environment. And so that's why it's actually important that we maintain their biodiversity in these environments. I said flies are beautiful until so you take a look at this. This is a horsefly. When you take a really close look at this horsefly, it has striped eyes, really striking, beautiful hairs on its face. And uh, so it's lovely, but this is actually a biter. And if it landed on you and began to sort of scissor into your skin with its proboscis here on the front of its face, its mouth parts here are called the proboscis, it cuts into the skin and sucks the blood that begins to flow. This housefly is actually a quite beautiful insect um, with habits that kind of irritate us and other mammals. This also is a horsefly. And this horsefly has an incredibly long proboscis and its long proboscis is used for taking the nectar from long tubed flowers in South Africa. So there are incredible, beautifully, beautiful sort of diversity of flowers in South Africa in an area called the Finbos. And these flies have adapted uh, to uh, take nectar from those flowers. And they're often then transporting pollen from one flower to another. And so these horse flies are actually a really important component of the sort of natural adaptations of pollinators and flowers in uh, that area of South America. Here's another photo of one of these long tongued horseflies uh, that have adapted to 
um, visit these long tubular flowers in South Africa. Now, what's interesting is that those long proboscis can also take a blood meal. And so it is possible for them to land on an elephant and get a blood meal um, with that long proboscis from, from biting an elephant or human. And so uh, flies are everywhere, even normal flies, what we call a normal fly that would show up in your backyard is often visiting flowers, crawling around, um, taking nectar, a sweet sugary substance from those flowers for energy. And when it visits the flowers in your garden, it's picking up pollen inadvertently and taking that pollen to other flowers. And so flies are actually a really important part of the natural environment just by sort of um, their normal daily life, lifestyle and become important pollinators in a lot of different systems. Now in the old days, this is a, a drawing of a fly by fly scientists in the 19th century. Uh, they would often draw flies in a beautiful depiction here with a flower on the same drawing. And you can see the parts, the anatomical parts of this fly are illustrated for the scientists to study. And we have a flower sort of adorning that picture uh, to make the fly even more interesting. And this beautiful natural history print is an example of sort of the, the sort of joy that the scientist gets from studying both the fly and the environment where he caught it. Here's another example from that same publication. Nowadays, we have digital cameras. Everybody goes on a walk, and you can take this a beautiful picture of an incredible fly, incredible insect diversity, and you don't have to illustrate it like this. You actually have the flower and the fly in close-up beautiful digital imagery. And this is an example of how, why I say, yeah, flies are incredibly beautiful. Uh, this, this fly that you might see in, on a normal summer's day uh, may not look beautiful to you from, from um, you know, way far away to your naked eye, but once you get a close-up image of it with a, a camera, uh, you can see its golden hairs and its beautiful red eyes and uh, appreciate something for the, the uh, diversity of this uh, interesting organism. This fly is a house fly, I mean, oh, sorry, a horse fly relative from Australia. It's uh, gr uh, beautiful uh, patterned wings, uh, gray and black striped uh, thorax and abdomen. And then it's covered with velvety red spots. Uh, and it's completely harmless. It doesn't bite like a horse fly that just visits flowers. And it's really strikingly beautiful. This little fly is called a bee fly. This fuzzy little fly uh, hovers over flowers here in North Carolina, for example, in the spring, they're really, really common here. Uh, it puts its proboscis into those flowers and, and takes nectar and it becomes an important pollinator in a lot of systems. And these little fuzzy, cute little flies are really common uh, all around us. This interesting fly is a parasite. Um, uh, it has a bright orange head and a beautiful green metallic body. And so we find incredible color patterns, diversity, and interesting lifestyles in uh, many, many different flies. And it's like, wow, every time I see a new one, I'm like, I didn't realize there was something so beautiful still to find out there in the diversity of flies. This is a flower fly, a, a, a fly that's very, very common here. These, these flies visit flowers, are important pollinators, and they're often very good uh, honeybee and bumblebee uh, mimics. This fly you can see is a mimic. Many people might think that that's a bee or a wasp. It's black and yellow pattern reminds birds that they once got stung by a bee or wasp. So birds might leave that um, fly alone just because it, it has evolved or adapted to look like uh, a bee or a wasp. But you can see that this is not a bee or a wasp because if you look closely, there's just one pair of wings. So just two wings make this a, a true fly. This fly is called the yellow dung fly. It's a very common fly in farm, in farm pastures uh, where there's cows. So on dung pats in cow, in cow pastures, these flies will be quite numerous. They use those cow 
uh, cow pats to lay their eggs and the maggots live in the cow pats. And this beautiful yellow, uh, interesting, bristly, hairy fly uh, uh, has a very interesting biology uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, in cow fields and pastures. Here are some flower flies mating on the wing. Really incredible flyers uh, with a lot of strength in their wings, finding each other in midair. This long-legged fly um, uh, has, uh, is often found in forests, like right here in North Carolina and other uh, places all around us. Really very, very abundant uh, crawling around on the leaf surface. Uh, these are predators, and so they're often uh, grabbing other insects and, uh, and eating them. Flies don't always look like flies. This interesting fly has a long, slender body. Its head is thin. It may be mimicking some kind of stick, or it may be uh, mimicking a slender tropical ant. Uh, but there, there are flies that are surprising in their shapes and in their sizes. Uh, this is another uh, flower fly uh, with, with mottled eyes. So I really think the more I look, uh, flies are actually beautiful. There's a lot of very beautiful striking flies uh, that are just all around us in the environment, perched on a, on a stem, uh, visiting a flower, flying through the air. Uh, you never know what you're going to find. This robber fly is a predator that catches insects in the air and eats them. It has a long pointed proboscis. Uh, it's like a hawk or an eagle <laughs> in, in uh, the fly world. It's a very large fly and it's very, very good at uh, catching other insects. Well, many, many flies are extremely tiny. This is a little two millimeter long fly and uh, there are thousands of these little flies all around us. Uh, this is sitting on the, on the top of a flower head. Uh, and so the closer you looked at a flower uh, or any other um, sort of uh, vegetation around us, you would find, find little tiny flies all living in there and doing their thing. This is a fruit fly, a true fruit fly, uh, related to uh, something you may have heard of before, like the med fly which becomes a pest of oranges and other citrus crops in Florida or California, or, or the maggot that's actually in the apple. When you say you have a worm in your apple, that maggot is from a true fruit fly uh, like this one um, or related to this one. And you can see that the long pointed end of this uh, female fruit fly lays its eggs through that very sharp pointed end uh, directly into the fruit. <clears throat> this is another fruit fly. You can just see how different it is from the one we just showed you. This is a fruit fly from Vietnam where its eyes are out on stalks. Its head has developed into a long, elongated uh, set of cheeks uh, that have the eyes on the end. So these aren't antennae. They look almost like the long stalked eyes of a snail, um, but they're completely rigid. And there's an eye on each end here. And these fruit flies use their head for jousting matches in competition between males uh, to impress a mate. So in almost any biological habitat, like this beautiful ridge in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, if you look around, there'll be, there are a lot of flies inhabiting this area really participating in the decomp decomposition of plants and animals back into the soil, sort of living out their lives, finding food, being predators and parasites of other insects, uh, finding nectar on these flowers. And, in, and when they're finding that nectar, then getting the pollen uh, that enables new flowers to be formed um, and for the sustaining this environment by providing food for birds and frogs and fish and other insects that live in this environment. And so flies do a lot of interesting things and they're actually a pretty important part of, uh, of our world. And so that gets us into these beautiful places, these uh, uh, 
really diverse and interesting places to study flies. And you can find them in your own backyard just to, because they're so small and because they're good flyers, they really are almost everywhere. And so it's a place like this that I really love to do my science, um, both because it's interesting and beautiful, but over this uh, sort of mountain stream riffle, what you can see as you look closer at everything that's going on around you, I can find a lot of different flies that are interesting to study. What I like to study are a uh, kind of fly called dance flies. It's just an example of one family of fly, uh, which are called dance flies because they do mating dances. The males try to impress each other with flags on their legs or by waving their wings. Uh, they often will do what they uh, what we would think of as like a dance in midair in a swarm where uh, they're, they're uh, looking at the, the females are judging the males by how good are the flags on their legs or uh, the shapes of their wings, various things. So they uh, are dancing flies or dance flies. And they're very, very common in these mountain stream ha habitats, the areas around mountain streams or in mountain habitats around, around the world. Some of those flies are very good at sort of flying out on the water surface and grabbing prey that have fallen into the water surface. Other insects that can't get up out of the water, these have long legs for uh, quickly skating out on the water surface and grabbing that prey. Some of these flies live in the splash zone on these rocks. They have long legs and uh, hydrophobic hairs for uh, shedding off the water that splashes on them. They crawl out on the water surface very, very rapidly. And all along the splash zone of the rocks in a mountain stream, you can see flies that are living right along that splash zone. Their larvae live on, in, in the sort of algae covered uh, surface of the rocks. Um, uh, which has a lot of food uh, for the larva and the adults spend their time at, um, sort of uh, uh, just above the water surface. This particular dance fly called Hillera is very, very common uh, in swarms over that riffle. And you can see its extended front legs here where the tarsus of that front leg is, ver is a, a very sort of swollen segment. And inside that swollen segment, there are glands that produce silk. Uh, and so this was discovered back in the 1920s that these flies basically have silk glands in their legs and they can use that silk to wrap their prey. Uh, they catch prey and then they wrap that prey and they'll give it to the female as sort of a wedding gift <laughs> to the female. And uh, it's one of the only uh, non-spider kind of insects that uses their uses their uh, silk in this way. Uh, here's another example of a, a dance fly. And as you can see, just like the horse fly that I showed earlier, dance flies have a long proboscis. Uh, they're good predators, often catching insects in flight. Uh, they don't bite people uh, with that, but they're, they're hunters of other insects. So in studying these dance flies and other related flies, we get to go to very interesting places around the world. This is a, um, uh, the mountains of Southern California, um, really a common uh, or well-known area um, uh, in the mountains outside of LA. And you wouldn't think that there are really important flies here so close to an urban area, but it's a really beautiful spot. And we've gone there and studied the flies um, in these uh, mountain canyons uh, in California. And in doing so, in this, in this part of Southern California, we have found a really interesting, small, three millimeter long fly uh, just by uh, catching flies and studying them in this habitat. So it's a really uh, good example of flies being everywhere and you never know what you're going to find. This little fly with the scientific name Epistomia uh, turned out to be sort of interesting because it's unlike any other fly we've found. Uh, it's a single species in its own family now that so is sort of a link between more ancient flies and more advanced flies. It has features of the ancient um, sort of uh, earlier dance fly type flies and features of the more advanced flies. And so it's a really important um, fly for us to study in the fly tree of life. 
And there's really only one of them that, that we know about. And they've all been collected from one spot. We've only ever found that fly when we collect in Southern California in this trap near this bush. Now that we know that there's probably many more of them around uh, and we don't really even know why it's there, uh, especially, uh, but this seems to be the place because they're full in this trap. There's lots of them in this trap and we don't catch them near any of the other bushes in this canyon. Uh, so we feel really lucky and it's a really unique thing that we've learned um, just by getting out there and sampling what's going on in the real world. So that keeps us going out, standing in the field, um, sort of looking for flies wherever we can. Keeps me with my head in my net as an entomologist interested in insects, uh, wanting to sort of be out there uh, and know what's going on, and then bringing those back to our lab uh, so that we can study their biology and diversity from, from basically um, their genetics. And so we just keep doing that and uh, find ourselves studying things that are not just near mountain streams. This stiletto fly is named a stiletto fly. A stiletto is a small knife. And it's named a stiletto fly because its antennae are shaped like small knives. This tiny two or three millimeter long stiletto fly is uh, uh, a typical uh, highly diverse family of flies that you find in dry deserts, the deserts of Australia, or the deserts of Southwestern US, or the deserts of Chile. Uh, and this stiletto fly, its larva is like a sandworm. It lives in, in between the sound, in sand and, and swims between the sand grains. And those larvae are vicious predators of other insects that live in the sand, like beetle larvae, for example. So this is a stiletto fly. And we find studying stiletto flies, my colleagues and I have found new species of stiletto flies. So this is a drawing of a new species that we found of stiletto fly that lives in, in uh, the, the, the dry parts or actually in the forests of Australia. And you can see its antennae are long blade-like st uh, stilettos and has long legs. <clears throat> it's a beautiful stiletto fly. And this is the, its habitat in the, in the uh, sort of forests of uh, um, Eastern uh, Australia. Now studying these stiletto flies uh, get us to places uh, like uh, the unique uh, Araucaria forest in Chile, in, in uh, the Southern part of Chile, where there's a very, very unique flora and fauna and we visited Chile to this area called Palmas de Ocoa in, uh, in Chile in the early 2000s. And there we found an entirely new family of fly. Here's an example of a, of a, a fly called Ibacoa and it's related to stiletto flies. It has extremely long legs, a long slender body and tiny thin wings, uh, but no scientist had ever seen this fly before. And just by visiting that spot, uh, we were able to find uh, an entirely unclassified group of, of flies. So flies are beautiful, they're fascinating, and they're everywhere. And we have examples and more examples to show for it. Uh, and uh, there's a lot to learn. And so that's really my message <laughs> today is that uh, flies aren't what you think they are. They're a lot more beautiful than they think you think they are. And if you take the time to look at what flies are doing, sometimes uh, they're actually doing great things and interesting things uh, in the natural world. So thanks very much, Chris. I know I just kind of went on. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Not a problem at all. That was great stuff. Gosh, yeah. so much diversity, so many beautiful shapes and sizes and colors in, in creatures that are that I so often overlook. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're out there not overlooking them. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, we did get a few questions in the chat. Oh, go ahead. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah. But I have one. I'm going to throw my question out there first uh, because I've been thinking about this since the beginning of the presentation mm. when you mentioned when flies first showed up in the fossil record mm. that they were they came before flowering plants. So 
were these early flies and fly ancestors like what do we know about their feeding habits if there weren't plant sources were they just feeding on dead meat so we know that early habitats for flies were probably if you can imagine uh, a, a swampy sort of area that's rich in organic matter where the plants aren't flowering plants, but they are giant tree ferns or ferny areas. There were, there were ferns that were as large as trees and things are, early plants are, are mossy, right? Uh, and so these were forests that were quite diverse with a lot of insects and a lot of interactions between insects. And so, these were before typical plants that we have now where there are flowers. Um, so when I say flowering plants, but there were, you know, the early conifers and, um, and plants that were like ferns where there was plenty of organic matter falling into the water. There was plenty, there were plenty of other insects and things there. So early flies were probably decayers of biological material and they didn't sort of adapt to feeding on flowering plants or visiting plants for nectar or pollen until they were actually flowers around. And uh, we think that when flowering plants occurred and began to diversify, uh, then a lot of different insect groups learned to exploit flowering plants as a resource. So a lot of the explosion in the diversity of flies, uh, has that happened or did that happen fairly quickly? Like, do you see a massive radiation event when all of a sudden, say, there's now there's flowering plants, so now there's thousands more kinds of flies? Yeah. Or has uh, this diversity developed over much longer periods? So we we find that there are episodes of radiation that are often um, sort of correlated with these sort of biological, um, historical biological um, events in history. And so uh, you can imagine that when flowering plants emerge on the scene and, start, and they become very, very successful, they start to fill habitats uh, with, their, with, with their success. Flies, which are very, very good at quickly adapting to their surroundings, all of a sudden find many new things to do. And so if you can move from feeding on a dying insect or a dead insect, part of the de natural decaying process, to then being clued into finding that insect before it's dead, then you can become a parasite of that insect. You find your food before it's actually fallen off its leaf. And so if a caterpillar is eating a leaf, you have the choice of waiting for that caterpillar to die, or you, you know, sort of, I'm being a little bit uh, sort of storytelling here, but, but if you can evolve a way or adapt in a way to find that insect that's going to be your food source before it's dead, um, then there's a new resource for you. You can, you can find living organisms to feed on. Or if you start to lay your eggs on the surface of the plant and, in, and instead of dropping to the soil and eating what's in the soil, you just burrow right in to the leaf itself and find nutritious leaf material to eat, that's a good new habitat for a fly. So. Evolution always finds the nooks and crannies, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> the and, space to and, exploit. and as the flowering plants became diverse, the things that eat flowering plants became diverse, and there's the, all of these sort of linked layers of diversity that grow up or, or build up around that. Mm -hmm. so let me grab a question from the chat box over here. Where is your favorite place to go studying flies? I really uh, like um, mountains. Um, mountain streams, mountain habitats, high elevation rainforests or high elevation pine forests in many different places. So I would say like my favorite places to go are the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina or the Pisgah National Forest here in, in North Carolina or the forests of California, Oregon and, and Washington. You know, there's fires there now, um, but they are really, really beautiful mountain habitats, rich in fly diversity. And uh, um, flies are really important pollinators in high alpine meadows. So uh, bees are up there too, uh, but the temperature extremes are, are really high in these high alpine meadows in the sense that it gets very, very cold, it's very, very cold in the mornings in uh, alpine meadows and flies tend to do a little better at, than bees at being pollinators in those environments. 
So there's a lot of different interesting things going on in mountains around the world uh, with respect to flies. I really like that habitat. Nice. I mean, it sounds like a wonderful place to do field nice. work. Yeah. Okay. Kate wants to know, what is a fly's vision like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so flies have compound eyes and um, those eyes are made up of individual facets where each facet of the compound eye is like an individual eye. Um, and those eyes, we're not quite sure, they may not see individually thousands of images, but the eye, the nerves in each one of those facets sort of integrate the image uh, back to the fly's brain. And so it builds a pattern of vision that it can see from each individual eye. So the detection of sort of patterns in the environment come from the ability of each of those eyes to pick up and um, bring together that image into, um, into an image, right? So they can see light and dark. Uh, they can see, see patterns and uh, uh, they're able to sort of make quick decisions, right? About where the opening is based on the, the images that they get from those individual omatidia, so the individual facets. And you can see that many flies have eyes that are not just compound eyes, but those compound eyes cover almost the entire part of their head. So they can see in many directions as well. I had a related question too, mm -hmm. because I, I seem to recall reading and learning that um, information coming in through a fly's eyes uh, transmits so much more quickly so mm -hmm. that, you, um, I want to say this was like an, an episode of a child's program or something like that. But if I'm mm. going to swat a fly, I'm moving in slow motion mm. relative to how fast the fly can perceive that I'm coming for it and get out of the way. Yeah, I'm not an expert on that aspect of flies, uh, but it sounds right to me. Um, <laughs> that the, and it, it seems like that's one of the, another way that they've adapted to be able to escape predators in their environment. So if you're a quick flyer, then all your senses are attuned to what's going on around you. And so they can feel the pressure of your hand coming, right? They can feel the, the breeze, the change in pressure uh, mm -hmm. of that hand coming. They're detecting with thousands of bristles all over their body. It's not just visual, um, but it's also the, the feeling of what's changed in the air around them. And they're all, they're attuned to escape uh, at, at a split second, right? Amazing stuff. All right, a couple more here. What is the largest known fly and what does it eat? Mm. So it's hard to decide what largest really means, but there are some very big flies. So there is a, 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 a fly in the tropical rainforests um, uh, called a pantophthalmid fly. It's hard to uh, even spell that for you. Uh, it's a long word, the pantophthalmid fly um, it is, about that long, yeah, maybe what, um, I don't know, eight like, centimeters. Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, and it looks like a large horsefly and its larva feeds in the trunk of tropical trees that have fallen. And so it's a wood feeding insect that bores holes into tropical tree trunks. Uh, these are trees that have fallen in the rainforest and the, the larva lives in these holes in the trees and it's such a large larva uh, that you, you can actually hear it scraping the holes out in this tree. And the fly itself is a very large horsefly-like fly, and the fly doesn't feed as an adult at all. So its mouth parts are harmless. It can't bite like a horsefly would. Uh, it's completely um, uh, just maybe takes a little bit of nectar or water as an adult. But as a larva, it's scraping away on, at the wood in a, in a tropical tree. That's a, a very large fly. That, that's a very large fly, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a good question. Katie is asking, are flies among the most studied of all insects, not counting mosquitoes? Well, you have to count mosquitoes because they're flies. Mosquitoes <laughs> are flies. So... And I think you don't even have to count mosquitoes necessarily to say, yeah, flies are probably one of the most studied, if not the most studied insect or organisms on the planet because the 
fruit fly has been a laboratory animal for longer than many, many other animals. And fruit flies have been a very, very successful laboratory animal. And early, early science, not early scientists, but scientists have also studied house flies because they're so common. You can get them for, you don't have to buy them for very much money. Uh, there's lots of house flies. They're easy to grow in the lab. So fruit flies, house flies, um, and, and mosquitoes are, are studied quite a bit in uh, every, every laboratory and university uh, in the world. And for a long time, they've been really, really important at making sort of uh, advances in things like understanding genetics, understanding development, uh, understanding um, the, the chemistry and biochemistry of living things. All right. Well, Brian, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us for BugFest. Thanks a lot. It's been really fun. And uh, I can't wait to see uh, all the other talks and uh, events uh, throughout the week. Thanks. Our pleasure. Uh, well, really, thanks for being here. This mm -hmm. We're so glad that we could get you to talk about our theme insect this year for BugFest, flies, mm -hmm. and how cool and incredible they really are. I'll yeah. remind everybody, uh, you can keep track of what programs are coming up for the rest of the week. Go to bugfest.org. There you can click on the programs tab uh, and see lots more programs that are coming up. Find some ones that seem interesting to you. Click register and you'll get an email with information about how to join those various programs. Uh, lots of great stuff going on. For example, tonight at six o'clock, we're going to play Bugfest Trivia. That's right. So yeah, definitely sign up for that one. Quizmaster Chris is going to be delivering trivia to you. We're going to have a lot of fun. And follow the museum, I should mention too. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There you can see updates as well about Bugfest this week. And of course, all the other great stuff that's happening here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We'll sign off now. Thank you again, Brian. And everybody, take care. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye, Chris.